research and study skills. Welcome. So the first and most important rule in the academic study at universities is always very, very carefully check your learning guide or course handbook or however it is called in different universities. This contains the vital information about your course. So you need to take the time to read it carefully before you shoot off any email to your professors or to administrators. Check whether you can find the information in your study guide, in your learning guide. It will also give you the necessary context in your university, the staff context, the convener of the course, the subject heads, the student support, library support. It will also usually give you a link to your library homepage. For instance, here for Nantian, uh, institute in Wollongong in Australia, that would be library.nantient.edu.au. Often study guides will also give you the information how to access the internal e-learning platforms that universities are using, whether this is Blackboard or Moodle based or any other kind. So, for instance, at the um, at the example of Nanten Institute, this is the Moodle platform through NTI Learn. So here the major tip is very, very carefully, always study the learning guide, study the course book. And then when it comes to your studying, learning and writing, one issue is really, really important and that is plagiarism. What is meant with plagiarism? Plagiarism is basically stealing. It's taking something, an intellectual property from somebody else and passing it off as your own. And it is a grave form of academic misconduct. So you would already commit plagiarism when you note something down literally for instance in your notes and then put it in your essays without putting quotation marks around it and giving the exact reference. For instance uh, you would give the uh, in the Harvard system the name, the surname of the author of the container of the intellectual property and the author of the piece uh, together with the abbreviation of the year. So for instance, Shearer 2020. And then when you quote or refer to a very concrete argument, then you give a page number. It's very important you give page numbers. Otherwise you can never really check. You can claim somebody says something in a, in a book that is 300 pages or an article that is 40 pages. And nobody has the time to read the whole book and see whether this is really some, somewhere set, this argument or this point is somewhere met, made in this particular book or article. So you need to give a precise page number. So when you do that in this form, in text references. It happens so easy when you are reading and taking notes and you you write down whole quotations because you think, well, wow, this is fantastically formulated. Always make sure if you do that, put quotation marks and make a note of the page so that you, when you write up your essay and you look at your notes, you don't think, well, oh, I came up with this formulation and I put it in my essay because then you will be committing plagiarism. It also pertains to the fact when you find summary articles and encyclopedias, survey articles and handbooks and so on, or even in other good introductions in books or in uh, articles, summary arguments about certain so scholarly discussions with references. If you simply then copy these references, this is a form of plagiarism. You cannot simply take somebody else's references and pass them off as if you had read the articles on the books 
that uh, they refer to. So be very careful about plagiarism. There are many helps. There are helps for the citation style, for instance, uh, Harvard, yeah, uh, and I give you here some uh, some exam uh, examples from the University of Sydney. Uh, there is in concrete uh, in Buddhist studies, for instance, uh, a very useful guidance called the Wisdom Study Guide from the Wisdom Publishers about academic conventions specifically to Buddhist studies, if, yeah, and so on. So please be very, very mindful. It is not a uh, cavalier's delay. It is a serious form of academic misconduct that could get you penalized by a fail or get kicked you out of the course if you do it. So don't plagiarize. Now, let's start now properly with study skills. How do we study? Well, you have to respect your subject. So you make room and space in your day where you take study serious. You just don't lounge around with uh, uh, with some intoxicating drink on the sofa and flip through a book. Studying is a form of work, so you need to take it serious. And you have to have the right attitude in your mind. You need to be alert, you need to be uh, awake and motivated. So, as the reader, you want to engage with a piece of a scholarship or a primary data set uh, or a primary text in the humanities like uh, a historical record or a scripture, a sacred text. Uh, so as the reader you should approach it actively, creatively and critically. Alert, always thinking and questioning and then when you find something where you think well oh maybe you could look at this a little bit differently or this is maybe more complex then you go also for that you go like like through a rabbit hole on a path of curiosity of detecting new things so you find a concept, you find it interesting, and you dig deeper, you look further, you gather the information, you combine the ideas in new ways, you clarify things that you found interesting, but maybe you think, oh, that needs a little bit more, I need to understand it a little bit more, or there could be a different approach to it. And then you apply and stretch the trajectory of thought and imagination in your reading, critical reading of a piece of scholarship. Yeah? So effective reading is like that. One thing when you first study for a subject you study from the and you don't know very much about it yet then a very important tip is advice is to always go for the most broadest form of scholarly um, uh, approach to a subject to the most detailed in other words you first look up something if you don't know or don't have an overview about the topic, let's say mindfulness and Buddhism. The first thing what you would do is you go to a good, a trusted academic encyclopedia, not Wikipedia, yeah, an academic encyclopedia and look up the word mindfulness. And then you tr follow the trail there, oh, what kind of literature are suggested there. And it will give you a summary, a trusted summary of a concept from where you then, that is the, the widest, yeah? And then you go closer. You might want to look at a survey article again in a scholarly publication, maybe something that is uh, referred to in an encyclopedia entry. And from the survey, then you want look, want, may want to look at uh, closer aspects. So you would be particularly interested in mindfulness in early Buddhism. So you would look at that and through these 
concentric rings of wider material treatments to closer material treatments, you can follow a path into more and more detail and complexity. It is very difficult to start with a very technical monograph first, unless such a monograph has a very good general introduction, which some do. That's also fine then. Yeah. So best is to, if you don't know much of, it, of a, a material, of a subject, go from the widest to the closest. Yeah. And this is also how you argue, you know. You go, you zoom in and then you zoom out in the conclusion you zoom out. From the introduction you zoom in into your research questions and into the details and then you do what is important in scholarship. You have a balanced, complex discussion of a specific topic and then in the conclusion you look further again to the wider picture. Okay. Reader's purpose, active, creative, critical. Now, so I already sp spoke a little bit about these concentric rings going from the wider to the closer, from the outside to the inside and then from the inside to the outside. So you start in your hunches, you start with what you is given in your reading lips. You can browse your library then regarding a subject uh, or a specific topic. Yeah. You can use scholar.google.com in order to find uh, more scholarly subjects. You can use uh, IE services by the library uh, when uh, your library uh, subscribes to JSTOR and similar or ProQuest books and so on, similar services. And then you prepare your essay from the broadest reading as I just told you to, of the subject to familiarize uh, with the main issues involved and with the main terminology. Yeah? And then you zoom in. Be always very careful about terminology. Be mindful when you use certain terms. They might have a long history in scholarly debate. Do not simply from your pre-existing knowledge assume that you know how in scholarship certain terms are used, but be very, very careful and try to find out as much as possible and be as complex as possible. Yeah? Avoid simplifications, reductionism and generalization. Yeah? Stay away from Wikipedia. Simple as that. I mean, Wikipedia is okay if you just if you don't know much or anything about a subject and you want to have a first impression, but the information is not reliable. It's become better. Ten years ago it was really terrible. It has become better, but it's not reliable. And uh, sometimes you can find some sources in the footnotes of the, the Wikipedia, but in general it's much it's much dis, uh, dissuaded. So I always tell my students never go to Wikipedia, never quote Wikipedia. I mean that's just a complete no-no. Yeah. Never take all your references from Wikipedia. Yeah. That's that's disingenuous and is almost plagiarism. And it is not. It doesn't. It it, it doesn't fulfill academic scholarly purposes. Yeah. So be aware. There's a reason that we have encyclopedias and handbooks written by real experts. Yeah? Because the hive mind that drives uh, Wikipedia and also the democracy of, uh, uh, of, uh, of expression of information that you have on the internet, every can, can write a blog. These are all not real guarantees or warranties for quality. Simply not. This is why we have people who are professors and doctors who have actually studied decades certain topics so they are experts and they are the one who write uh, uh, whom you should trust. I mean, so go to the encyclopedias, the scholarly encyclopedias and handbooks and so on. Or look at a good monograph that has a very decent general introduction to a topic. Also very good. And then if you have a, something that interests you specifically, look for the very specific, very technical, detailed 
articles and go in as you go from the wider to the you go down the rabbit hole and can go you follow the breadcrumbs of your curiosity and you it will lead you into a world of complex wonders and that is academia no easy answers no easy solutions and any generalization almost any generalization you can find in your preconceptions can and must be challenged yeah so that is academia not really answering simply questions but making questions much 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 more complicated so when you look at a particular text and an, its argument what you need to do is in order to follow the argument is you need to reflect on the parameters of the text what is how is it laid out how is structured also in which context is it given an article on mindfulness in a healthcare encyclopedia is very likely not be able to give you in-depth knowledge about something related to mindfulness in Buddhism right? be very very clear also a technical article um, on texts and history has is a very has a very different focus than a general survey chapter or literature review yeah? so be mindful and so that is what we call parameters and context of the text sometimes authors have a very clear uh, background that they follow the, f the uh, authors come from different schools of thinking authors comes from different positionalities and authors also write for different audiences you cannot take a news article a journalistic piece for instance or a general knowledge book or a little podcast that you found uh, by somebody generally introducing something on the internet uh, with, and on the same level as a very technical academic scholarly output now there are also very technical academic podcasts uh, having done some of myself I would know but you know you have to always question and look what is the context who's the audience who's the intended audience in which context is a certain topic presented and after that what you do is obviously you follow the sequence of the ideas as they are presented in the text be critical yeah? always ask yourself if the author is here actually providing evidence giving a fact sometimes authors present something as facts and they give you some references but if you then look at the references that these are then seen that these are hypotheses or or speculations and not really uh, that the uh, the uh, the referring author then makes into facts so be very uh, alert of that sometimes things are presented as facts they are not facts they are opinions make these dif uh, differentiation if somebody even a very erudite good scholar uh, says well in my opinion or if i'm allowed to uh, express a hypothesis here then you know this is a very erudite opinion but it is still an opinion what you need to do yourself is to examine the evidence you need to go back to the data you need to go back to the primary sources you need to if if a key element of research is referred to a key article or set of data go back to that and check actually if the author has not simply presented something to be true but is actually not found in the data or in the text always ask what does the text the evidence say and look at the nature of the language that is being used is there is the way something is presented is it persuasive is it co is it cohesive or is it more suggestive so it is very different from reading a novel or also just a, a non-fiction just for pleasure it is 
reading and being alert having a meta level turning around in the wheels of your head at the same time while you absorb the reading the information yeah always often you have the meta level the meta level critical C critical comes from the word krino krino in greek in ancient greek means to discern it doesn't mean to criticize <laughs> It means to be alert and discern, to differentiate, to keep a questioning mindset. Not in a mean way, not because you don't like somebody or you want to find a flaw, but just being alert. Because as humans, we all always make judgments and present opinions sometimes as facts and so on and we this is how we can actually check so even if there's this great scholar still they might have blind spots and biases or might at a detail misinterpretate uh, evidence so be uh, be alert be discerning critical discerning now there are some concrete methods, one I want to introduce, that you can follow when you read for study. There is one that is called the SQ3R method because of the beginning of the uh, terms. Yeah. S for survey. Survey what is going on. And follow the question question read recite review so note down then read and see well what is what did i not understand what seems weird or where do i need to move more read up and then if you want to retain the main information read it back loud to you for instance a definition of mindfulness that you come or a uh, and then review SQ3R method. Just one of the uh, more uh, high school and undergraduate study methods or a method that you can use if you still have to gather a lot of uh, general or basic information on a topic before you can delve deeper. Effective note-taking, it's another very important uh, area. Well, it is like in every area of life, think before you do, be mindful, yeah? be mindful. So before you jot something down, ask yourself, is that really important? Don't copy long quotes, keep it brief, summarize, summarize in your own words. Keep it also organized. If you have an interesting detail, that is not part of the main argument, argument, put it maybe in a different column, put it in a different hierarchy, maybe also in a different color. So organize it in a way that you can easily understand, uh, differentiate the important uh, summary, summative argument from the things that you find interesting and want to retain and want to look for further, but which are not completely necessary for the argument argument and always leave enough space to when you revise it and revisit is to actually uh, add some things yeah so obviously you can do whatever you want however you want you have a, a probably long history from uh, from primary and high school and uh, undergraduate you can use your own abbreviation um, do bullet points instead of full sentences mark keywords uh, heading points, different colors, you name it. You can ma make linkings, the, the, uh, whether you're more textual or more visual, you can do all kinds of errors and boxes. Important is if when you write something down literally or in a very close paragraph, paraphrase, you know, if you paraphrase something very, very closely, this can also be seen as plagiarism. Yeah? Mark very clearly where you get it from mark very clearly where you get it from 
exact source information with page numbers. It's a pet hate of mine. You know, people just uh, point to one side argument in a huge book that they find and just write the whole book. You know, am I as a reader then who needs to go back and look at this, whether that's actually understood completely or whether that's really what is there in the text, am I then supposed to read through 300 pages in order to know whether this reference is true or not? No, you need to give me a page number so I can check. Okay. Uh, not useful thing is simply writing out huge chunks. I mean, that is useful when you have a large set of poetry or prose where you want to memorize quotations for your erudite uh, like dinner parties conversation that you quote some Homer or you quote from a Buddhist uh, poetry from the Dhammapada or or from a Sutta or whatever you want yeah but it's not useful in academia don't copy huge chunks use your own words and make it short also you normally have very limited word count and it's important that you learn to keep uh, keep uh, adhering to word counts so don't lose a lot of words on quotations also try to keep it brief keep it as brief as possible that when you read back the notes you can still understand the argument yeah? there's no point in writing too lengthy notes it's a it's fine of it's a it's a it's an exercise in in summarizing and putting it in your own word and understanding so it should be concise so there is another a method um how you can effectively do this uh, the so-called cornell method yeah cornell a famous institute of higher uh, education in in america uh a university so the cornell method means that you have a sheet of paper yeah sheet of paper and then you fold it you divide it into so on one hand on one on one side you can summarize the content and then then you can question the summary with your own and add to the summary with your own understanding and critical remarks for instance oh this sounds a little bit odd or um, I'm not quite sure uh, I follow this uh, specific uh, uh, trajectory of argument here and so on yeah so you're all discerning remarks you can put at the other hand and possibly using another color so you have it both spatially and aesthetically uh, differentiated and then the mat the the trick is is to see whether you can follow the argument of an article or of a book or a chapter by just reading this second half so you fold the paper again so you don't see the summary on the first half yeah and you just read your own discerning critical remarks and see whether you can actually follow and then you go back to the text the chapter or the journal and we reread it and compare it with the second half of the sheet sheet and see whether actually your understanding and your discerning remarks are on point so that's a very very good method do that a couple of times it will become so natural to you to uh, to have this uh, side where you read and the other side where you have a meta understanding where you understand and discern at the same time it will become very naturally with with exercise with training like that so now let's go back you all will be asked in your uh, studies when you take university courses on undergraduate or postgraduate level to do assignments there are some courses will have exams but most courses will have some sort of a written assignment you can call that an essay if you want and these essays are in structure generally the same as you would find in good scholarly journal articles they have a title 
they have an introduction where you state the topic they give a discussion and an analysis they have a conclusion and a bibliography sometimes they would have footnotes other times it would basically a uh, footnotes would not necessarily be needed because you would have in-text references you would still be able to have endnotes if there is a point that is not really uh, or an appendix uh, if there are points or data that is, are not really necessary uh, directly necessary for your argument but wi which are actually um, a good background or very interesting in the uh, in the course of your research so in order to write this kind of essay which is basically the training course for writing in academic journals journal articles and chapters in the course of that you need basically project management it's a project it's a serious thing you know it's a project so you need time management you need your own angle on the research idea if you have a prescribed assignment you need to find your specific uh, access route to it and you need to observe the one-off deadline hmm. so an essay could have a feature of a report and you could include an abstract very often journal ar articles will ask you for an abstract and an abstract is very different from a conclusion an abstract is a very concise summary of the whole uh, argument of introduction uh, argument and conclusion we will talk about what a conclusion is in a second but it's not like the same as an abstract but asked asked your tutor asked your course conveyor before i usually for undergraduate and postgraduate essays I don't uh, I don't advise or I don't necessitate doing abstracts for a dissertation an MA dissertation and Phil dissertation PhD dissertation of course you need to will be able to write abstracts because dissertations for MA and Phil and RAS PhD they are basically in the structure the same as essays but just much longer with much more sub points but they have the same general structure of title introduction then often you have a literature review you have a discussion data presentation data analysis or presentation of uh, the textual basis and uh, discussion of that and analysis of that and critical review and so on then a conclusion appendixes bibliography and so on oh in order to plan an essay it is good to be organized there are three steps research organization after research of the organization of the contact draft writing and draft finalizing completing and for each step you should take in time management terms uh, some some uh, some framework you know in the, uh, depending how how you feel that you need how much time you need or what your experience is how much time you need for instance for the research for the first research you would need to reflect about methods and what kind of information is needed you need to how to get them you get all the library books out you get from the e-library you get the journal articles you need you read them you reflect upon them and depending on how much time you need and you can this this could be two weeks three weeks four weeks it could be done in two days depending how much you are already in the research topic and once you assemble everything and you read everything and you did your notes and so on then you need to start according to the research question to group the information and select actually what you need very often students make the mistake in trying to show me that they read a lot of stuff and that is great but if the information you read is not really pertinent to the argument you want to present then uh, don't put it in the essay an essay is not an opportunity to sh show me how smart you are an essay is an opportunity to look 
within a very constrained word count at a certain important question in detail with complexity. Another problem with grouping and selection of information is don't select too general information. Yeah, you, If you mention, for instance, the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, you don't need to enumerate them in a Buddhist studies course. You might need to talk about them in a healthcare course where people might not necessarily know about them and what they are. But in a Buddhist studies or religious studies course, you can assume that people have the basic knowledge of know what um, the Four Noble Truths are or what Trinity means in terms of Christianity or and, and so on. Yeah? These kind of things. So don't fill up space with information that are basically just dictionary and encyclopedia knowledge that you are expected to know. You don't need to show me. I expect you to know. And it needs to show through the way you are actually um, approaching the subject and in a complicated, complex, balanced way, research it, analyze it, discern it, critique it. Yeah. So then the writing of the draft, it could take, so the organizing it could take two days, three days, you know, it just give you an example. You make your own time management schedule. Then for the writing, that takes normally a bit of time because you need to reflect you need to write. Usually you don't start with writing the introduction because um, you don't really know often where it goes, the argument. So you can write a preliminary introduction that needs to be with your preliminary understanding, which you need to throw away at the end. Because the uh, after the discussion of the data and the conclusion, you have to actually write the introduction. So to make sure that the introduction, discussion and or analysis and conclusion actually match up. Yeah. So here some very experienced people just write one draft and then finalizes. Very often this will not apply to undergraduate and postgraduate students. Many drafts will not need to be usually two, three or four. So give yourself enough time to write different drafts and be ruthless with your own word. There's no, no idea, oh, I found such a great, I'm such a great writer and I found such a great, great, great formulation. I can't let it go. If it is not fit for purpose, it might be a great formulation, but it is simply not uh, will not get you a good grade. So be ruthless with your own writing, revise, redraft, and so on. Yeah. And then the completing phase, you should at least took two days, maybe a little bit longer, yeah. where, where you, you, you cross all the T's and dot all the I's. Yeah. You, you check the references again, you go back to the references, you check them, you write them up. If you haven't put them in in the beginning, you produce the final draft. And then very importantly, don't forget proofreading. I don't want to, to have all these unnecessary spelling, grammar and style problems. Your style needs to be academic, not journalistic. It should not be how you talk to you with your friends in the pub. It needs to be sophisticated, it needs to be complex, it needs to be void of reductionist generalizations and simplifications. Proofread for grammar, spelling and style. Proofread in the bibliography for consistency. Yeah. So if you put things, uh, the titles of the books are put in italics, make sure they are all in italics. If you use uppercases for the titles, use consistently uppercases. Use consistently where you put the full stops and so on. Yeah. Make all these things, then you will make um, uh, uh, pedantic professors like me very happy, very happy. Be pedantic. Pedantry is actually very good in scholarship. Yeah, Be pedantic, in other words, precise. Be precise also with your usage of primary material. Uh, use scientific transliterations for uh, different languages. Yeah, 
just don't write uh, for instance just um, Sansara S R M S A R A write it correctly as it w as a transliteration from the Sanskrit with an M with a dot and on the second A an M hyphen uh, an M dash so that we know that this is a long long R Sansara and so on. Be precise, be pedantic in the best type of way. Be a real nerd about it. Yeah? It will get you a great impression with your professors if you pay attention to detail. Always pay attention to detail. Scholarship is very very much about paying attention to detail. The internet is full of people who are just spewing one uh, wild speculation after the other and wild conspiracy theory after the other because they don't pay attention to details, to the complexity of things, to actually the nerdy pedantic stuff that would uh, make somebody a good scholar. Yeah, Please be pedantic nerds <laughs> like I am. <laughs> okay, right. So um, now I give you an example. If your assignment in, in a course uh, gives, uh, asks you to write something about yourself in terms of an autobiographical approach. Yeah? And in, in many subjects, also in the humanities and education, social science, this is more and more done because an autobiographical uh, method aims to train you in your own positionality and train you in your own reflexivity where you reflect on your own positionalities. For instance, if I write you, ask you to write an ecological autobiography, then I want you to reflect on your own position, where you are through the story of your life, through the experience of your life in terms to, in relation to ecology and sustainability. Or the same with religio religious, uh, your religious positionality. That should make you sharp and alert uh, of the fact that wherever from whatever we're doing in scholarship, we write from a certain angle. You know, I write from the angle of a white person. I write from an angle who has deep experience with Christianity and at the same time is a Buddhist a Buddhist practitioner and teacher in the Tibetan tradition. So. I'm very aware of my positionality. So that is called reflexivity and positionality. An autobiographical um, short essay can help you with that. And actually, in effect, when I have PhD students, I usually make them write a short chapter or at least a couple of pages on their positionality, no matter what they do, even if they do something very technical with some Chinese or Tibetan or Sanskrit text, I still want them to reflect on their own positionality. So in this case of an ecological autobiography, you would, you would be able to discuss and detect your own relation to the history or the genealogy, how it comes to be, as a researcher who is now doing something, maybe in religion and nature, your own position in this human earth community. And you would be able to, before you go into this wider topic of religion and nature, to reflect and if appropriate challenge your own biases and your own background own and in other words your own informal hypothesis and biases towards the topic here for instance ecology and sustainability and religion yeah so that's a, the example for assignment and assignment one that looks at uh, autobiographical method and then another assignment could use ethnography whether that is face-to-face -face ethnography or digital data ethnography. Well, ethnography is a method, a methodology in qualitative research. Qualitative research is means that we look at data, but we look at the particular at the data in depth. 
and we don't abstract from the quantity that's quantitative reserve of uh, data uh, trends but we look at the particularity of the specific responses or the specific drama so and here uh, ethnography aims to explore cultures and communities through their own representations and in digital data ethnography they're digital or internet data representations yeah so you can do that behind the computer browsing not for funny cat pics like i normally browse at the internet but actually seriously researching taking a serious you know you look at the data in their representations uh in the uh, in digital form and where possible you should then and then collect data through informal participant observation and a qualitative unstructured or semi-structured interviews and if a pickle also you can use autoethnographical accounts yeah if you go down the route of actually talking to people, not just observing by participating, but uh, for instance, particip participate at a uh, climate action uh, community event or uh, at a religious gathering, depending on what kind of ethnography you do. But also you talk to people. You can do that informally, what we call that informal qualitative uh, information gathering. But if you do it a little, but you, if you do it in terms of unstructured or semi-structured interviews, then you would make sure that you follow guidelines. For an undergraduate and postgraduate level, research ethics is usually um, and not done in a sense that it is has to go through a committee first. From MA level, MA uh, thesis level onwards, it needs to go through a panel to check that you're actually doing the right thing but you can do it on postgraduate level for an essay obviously already yeah uh, but then you need to make sure that you adhere to very strict guidelines when you communicate with communities so you need to identify yourself and the research object project yeah so that the community knows what you're doing and you need to clarify that you will not use people's names unless you to uh, interview somebody very important in a certain uh, public figure uh, or a community figure and then you would need to get their uh, their written or email consent to use their name and you need to give them the opportunity to check everything what you write down in terms of the interview and if it is not a and if it's not a, a community leader or a, a popular uh, uh, a figure of public a public figure then whoever you speak to you need to make unidentifiable so if you go to a very small religious community and there the, uh, there's always the same five people and there's only one uh, woman in their 50s there then you you cannot even write a woman in her 50s in this community said this and this and this because it would make her identifiable yeah so you need to give if you introduce um people you speak to you need to give as much data about them as possible without so while it is still impossible to identify them and if appropriate, ask specific people uh, if they would wave, want to waive their anonymity. And I always ask final approval for any used raw data, interviews, emails. And then finally, when you wrote your piece, even if it's an undergraduate or postgraduate essay, it's important that you share it with the community from where you got data, right? So. Ethnography. So that is an example for an assignment that looks at the method of ethnography. Yeah? You start with your own positionality, you formulate a hypothesis, you present the data, you discuss or analyze the data and your conclusion. So it's a, it's a take on the general essay structure here where positionality and hypothesis are important and where usually the analysis is split into presentation and discussion okay and then conclusion now let's have a 
one word further word on conclusions. Conclusions are not summaries. Conclusions give a concise, maybe one or concise or two concise sentences in what the research has shown and then they develop something on top of that. It's not simply a summary. They develop uh, further possible venues for critical investigation. They think, well, okay, so the question now that need to be further looked at are this. And you, you can do some hypothesizing and conclusions. You can offer some ways forward. But it should not and never be simply a summary, a descriptive summary. Yeah. This differentiation between description and analysis is very important when it comes to your passing marks and whether it's a very difference between uh, simply a passing uh, or a credit pass and a distinction and high distinction pass. It's very important. High distinctions do we have really sharp discerning analysis, you know, which is much stronger developed than uh, simply descriptive. So learn to be concise in your descriptions and summaries so that you have more room in your essay for discerning discussion analysis, critical, critical analysis. So final example and that is in the humanities the standard that you have a research essay there where which is uh, focusing on data that you find in text, secondary and primary text, primary texts being, for instance, the sacred scriptures of rich religions, and secondary texts being the scholarship written about that. Yeah, So data-centric research essay which focuses on critical analysis and that follows the appropriate hermeneutical principles. Now, what's hermeneutical principle? Hermene hermeneutics means the art of interpretation. It comes from the Greek god Hermes, you know, who was the interpreter, the translator of the gods, the will of the gods to the humans. So hermeneutical strategies mean strategies of interpretations. And here we need to f start with being really aware of the complexity of an issue that it can be approached from a multitude of angles. So you would need for a research question often polythetic or multidimensional approaches. And you need to be wary about truth claims, objective truth claims and value judgment that you also might find in research. Yeah? It is not an aim of your research to make such claims. Yeah? For instance, if you are researching Buddhism, your aim is not to check whether Buddhism is right or wrong. As researchers, they, we, we don't have opinions about that. We only look at evidence and we only look off what is presented. So. It's not about truth claims, it's about or it's about contextual meaning and function. No? We want to understand Buddhism, Buddhist cultures. We don't say they are a Buddhist notion of uh, nirvana is true or false. That is not a viable research question. But we can identify how the concept, the Buddhist notion of Nirvana has been understood, is being understood, how it has been contextually meant, become meaningful for communities and which function it has for a religious or philosophical community. Okay. I mentioned this close readings that proceed wider, wider reading. Now that is now the after you made your research where you go from the wider to the close. That is that is that is now here the opposite, right? As a hermeneutical strategy. In other words, if you make if you make an assertion about something, you need to go from the, the closest uh, point outwards. 
you need to start with the text if it's text and they or with the data always ask yourself what does the text say what does the data say don't forget all these prejudgments that you find in secondary literature always check is the text actually supporting that what does it say how the, is what the text says meaningful in its own context rather than in the context that i want to research so there there with own context you need to know something about what kind of genre is the text is it a narrative is it a fairy tale like a jataka in buddhism a birth story is it poetry is it a contemplative generalized treatise or is it a highly technical philosophical treatise is it meant for practitioners and meditation meditators or is it meant for intellectuals in an uh, intellectual debate for instance if you look at narratives and at poetry they seldomly give you a coherent philosophical discourse they use metaphors they can convey a lot of important insight and they show you something about uh, a certain world view but their purpose is not to construct this world view Un unless you have didactic poetry which you all which which you have like Luc lucretius de natura uh, and so on um but that is a, a very specific form of uh, of uh, of didactic poetry yeah uh, so, but if you just have like uh, wonderful little devotional poetry like the Terigatas and the um, Dhammapada and Sudanipata, they don't want to give you a catechism of Buddhism, an overview of Buddhist doctrine. Huh? You also need to be aware that if a text claims it's historiographic, it, that it contains references to history, it still might be predominantly fictionist and that is true for many of the southeast as uh, south asian chronicles there's a lot of basically fictional narrative in there that has a political function uh, so they can uh, it's the same with biographies you know people can write these kind of self-mystifying or mystifying biographies you know? they can just be as fictitious and have certain functions and certain meanings uh, so don't take things on face value look at the context and so for that we apply the methods of literary theory so we look at intertextuality illusions and so on we look at narratology how is a narrative constructed and so on we look at it from a question of power what is the or and agenda so for instance in feminist literary theory we look at what how is uh, is uh, here the power balance or imbalance between uh, the sexes and the genders uh, constructed uh, we always ask qui bono who benefits from actually presenting something in a certain way yeah. then also you need to look at the intended audience so what was the intended audience and also what was the likely or the factual reception of the text by the intended audience so is there a specific function that a certain text has fulfilled for the intended audience does the source position itself position itself conforming or non-conforming with the intended audience yeah so is it is it actually arguing against something or is it uh, reasserting already a position and then what is uh, the texts or the data significance and application in the wider discourse that so then you go okay so you have the context the context of the text itself the context of the audience in space and time no, that can change in space and time a text is then received or you have reception history and so on and then in the wider context you can use ask questions more pungently about power about imbalance you can use deconstruction discourse analysis feminism queer theory all these kind of things but you go start with the text and if you start to speculate um please always go back to the text ask yourself the simple question is what i am 
now maintaining, what I'm now stating, what I'm now opinionating, is that actually evidenced and contained by and contained in the text? In other words, the one simple question, what does the text say? Hermeneutical sincerity also implies that it is not only the context of the text that you need to reflect upon, but also the context of the reader of the text, and that is yourself. You are, the moment you read texts or data sets, you are in a mutually dependent discourse. You are creating a nexus of reader reception and text, text reception reader. So in other words, in order not to fall into your own unreflected biases, you need to know where do I stand? Am I sympathetic, averse or indifferent with the issue raised? You know, Is my gaze Eurocentric, Americano-centric, Australia-centric? Is it Orientalist? Is it colonialist? Or is it post-colonialist? Does it come from a subaltern position? Be aware of self-mystification as fact as fiction of the hidden discourses also with regard yourself. And make a distinction uh, or negotiate. You cannot always the, the, the distinction is actually very often blurred, but, but negotiate this crucial insider-outsider distinction. Because as researchers, we have a certain position. So that makes us, but we are also trying to use critical analysis in, a, in an evidence-based way for scholarship. And that makes us, in a sense, outsiders. So, we, for instance, we could be Buddhists, or we could be Christians, and researching Christianity or Buddhism at the same time. And so, at the same time, we need to be aware of this dynamic of the insider, the emic distinction, uh, uh, dimension, and the outsider dimension, the ethic. We just need to be reflective about. There is the danger if we exaggerate or to pretend too much that as observers and as, as, as researchers we are objective. That we are not actually owning up to our own possessionality, our own reflexivity. And then we make a lot of mistakes we just, because we just read into a text our own unreflected biases. You know? This uh, is then, for instance, ideological readings. Yeah. Proof texting. Yeah. You know what the truth is and you just want to tr find it in the text. So that is called proof texting. You find that very often in conservative or evangelical theology. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's Christian, uh, Islamic or also Buddhist. You know, There's a people just maintain that there is a certain position they take and then they read it into the text. They don't really ask what does the text say in its own context and in, in time and space, but they just read it into it. So, and that is, um, we should be very wary of this whole idea of objectivity. Rather, reflective subjectivity re reflecting on your own subjectivity and trying to be as evidence-based and dispassionate while being aware of your subjectivity is the best approach. It doesn't mean that being aware doesn't mean that you, you need to wrestle with your own biases, with your own position. Yeah? You don't put your own position into uh, consciously into it, yeah, but you are aware of it, you hold them in mind and you wrestle with them and you ask yourself, am I writing this conclusion now because it reflects my own position and my own bias? Or is it really evidence-based? So in other words, can you be mindful and dispassionate by while being aware of your own position? So that follows now is general advice on academic writing skills. So, you have limited word count. 
So that means avoid repetition. Avoid things that are just dictionary knowledge that is expected from you to know. Avoid waffling. <laughs> yeah? Be concise. Then, be wary of generalization. Don't generalize. Avoid associative thinking. Yeah. In your research, you can go the rabbit hole. You can think, oh, this is interesting. I have to read up on this. Oh, this is interesting. But you don't do that in an essay. You don't just associate your way through an analysis or through a discussion part. In other words, you, uh, you avoid enthusiastic speculations. Follow a structure. Always ask yourself, is the argument that it prevent that I am providing is it based on evidence and what the what the text says the data says uh, can I support it by evidence and is it logical is it built one building uh, stone one building compartment uh, on the other yeah so be very logical in your construction and avoid authority proofs don't say well oh yeah and then this professor that this in this interview and so on so it must be true no every anybody even professors can say things that are not true <laughs> authority proofs are very bad proofs you don't need to do that yeah um use ample and vari varied secondary literature that you actually read yourself. Don't copy references from secondary literature. Read the literature yourself. You use a broad base of contemporary scholarship. So if you just look at two articles, it's usually not enough to support a good balanced argument. It depends. Some, some very technical uh, research topics, obviously there is not much scholarship on there. So that's a, but usually on undergraduate and postgraduate level, there's plenty of scholarship that you can find and that you should use. Use as widely as possible also from different angles. Yeah. Don't just follow the references of one article. Try to fall in independent references. You might see, actually find very, very different views. And check for yourself. If there is a crucial argument that you found somewhere and that you think is very uh, persuasive, Go and check anything, any building stone of this argument for yourself through the references and through the evidence in the text. Yeah. And if you find a generalized statement in, this, in scholarship, unfortunately there are some, <laughs> there's a lot of bad scholarship too. Yeah. So if you find them, be instantly worried. Don't accept something on face well. You always dig deeper, dig deeper. Things are complicated. Don't get seduced by the idea that you can make them easy. They are not. Things are simply complex. You need to show me in your essay that you're starting to get a grasp with the complexity of things, not that you can produce easy answers. And always be precise. Also, there's a lot of scholarship that is not precise, that is not using the correct terms or that is, that is uh, very messy and, and, uh, and uh, um, nonchalant with, uh, with, uh, with very complex things. So always try, even if, you, if there's a good article, but it's, it has not the, uh, the formal preciseness that you would need for a nerdy pedantic professor like me, Go and check and edit. Go the extra mile and check any other scholars assertion against the primary evidence. That's the basic. So now you can find on the internet quite a lot of great tips for writing graphs. I give you here this uh, this uh, this website. Um, when, when you read this what I put up here, you will find a lot of the things that we talked about today, about from not necessarily thinking you start with the introduction and finish with the bibliography. Um, 
it's there's no uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, having a first draft done quickly because uh, you it will force you to go back and and uh, you know refine and refine uh, make sure your time management is okay keep your topic question and thesis in mind I, I don't I don't even know why uh, why this comes up all the time but it se there seems to be some some sort of general a drive in us human that we know obviously we are asked a question and we should answer that question but then we get so excited and enthusiastic about uh, all the ranges of topics that the question pertains to that we just do our own thing so please 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 if you have a specific assignment question sometimes with two or three sub questions make sure that these are the questions you are actually answering. Remind yourself always, you know, a couple of days in, a couple of weeks in, always go back to the research question and check yourself, am I actually answering that? And when you read the, uh, the near final draft, the important question is, is, did I actually answer the assignment? Because I had essays that I had to fail because they simply, they were good, but they, in, in, in theory, there were good things in them, but you know, they simply didn't answer the research question. So keep the question in mind. And you, you can write confidently. You don't need to think, well, oh yeah, I don't know, but I think it might be like this. This is not how you write. If you have, an insight right in a cohesive way with conviction but don't be overconfident that is another problem that you have especially with this kind of uh, with an idea of entitlement you are here to learn this is not your your chance to show how fantastic you are of course but you are mainly here to learn. So we don't expect you, we professors don't expect our students to be perfect. These are all training grounds and exercises. So don't be cocky, don't be overconfident. But you also don't need to write, well, I think this and this. This is just empty words. We really don't need to know. Of course, what you write down, what you analyze is what you think. So be, be confident without being uh, overconfident and entitled. Um, yeah, save the drafts, pay attention to the logic. I talked a lot about that, you know. When you read your argumentation, ask, is the research question really stated and is the argumentation supporting the answering of the research question in a logical way? In other words, do you weave an argument like a red thread through the essay or is it just disjunctive sections of information that you put are there without much critical analysis analysis so these are some just of the writing text that uh, tips that you can read on your own i gave you the internet address here and with that i finish this tour de force through research and study skills i hope it's useful i hope it's useful and i hope we have a lot of uh, fantastic uh, research study and essays coming out of, of that. Just simply follow uh, the main, main guidelines and you will be okay. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.